For example, so the most important instruction is in blue on the top of the screen. Outermost operation. So what is the outermost operation? Multiplication. So if I add some extra parentheses in blue, so these are not parentheses that need to be in there, but they're parentheses that will help you see with outermost operations. So in blue, I'm going to add some extra parentheses, and it looks like this. So it's first term times second term. So we are dealing with multiplication, so we have to use the multiplication rule or the product rule. So write out the product rule right now, see if you can write it out without looking at the screen. Or back at your notes. So I want you to go ahead and do the product rule here. The only tricky part is, what is a derivative of cos 2x? You have to use the chain rule when you get the derivative of cos 2x. So give this your best shot. So what I wrote is almost correct. So let's go over from the left side to the right side. So the first term here is a little bit easier to see. Derivative x squared is 2x times, you just copy down the other term right there. So this is u prime, oh, let me do this in blue, u prime v right there. So that's sort of the more straightforward term to see. Plus, over here I copied down the first term, which is x squared, but what am I missing? So it looks like I'm subtracting, but I need to multiply by a negative sign. So you really need to use some extra parentheses here, so you know you're multiplying by that negative quantity, not subtracting. Now I did the chain rule in here, so this is v prime, everything in the parentheses is v prime. How do you do the chain rule? I'll use green to circle what I'm focusing on first. So <clears throat> looking inside here, I, d I only want to look at v. So the derivative of this, the first thing <coughs> is deal with the cosine. That's the outermost operation before you deal with the 2 times x. So it's really important that you see the outermost operation. So what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine. Now negative sine of what? Negative sine of the original. So you don't change that. So it's negative sine of 2x, and you see that right there. Now, you've taken care of cosine, so you go to the next layer inside, which is 2x, derivative of 2x is just 2. So that's the times 2 at the end that you see there. So any questions on that derivative? Say why there's a 2 at the end again. The, we do derivative of cosine first, which is negative sine. You copy down the original. And then, forget about that cosine. Now you go to the next layer inside, and you take the derivative of that remaining part, which is 2. So a good way to think about this is you're making a sculpture out of whatever ice, 
rock. You're chipping away, you're breaking off pieces. So you have to do it carefully. So eventually you want to get down to the x, basically. But in order to get there, first there's the cosine function. And after the cosine function is removed, there's still a multiply by 2, a 2x. Two so you're basically just chipping away. Another way to think about it is those little Russian dolls that are stacked together. You're sort of pulling out the outer layer first and then doing the same procedure. You're opening up the inner layer and the inner layer and the inner layer. The only tricky part is sometimes it's not function composition. Here, the outermost thing was multiplication. So it's not always chain rule first. It could be other rules. And that's where derivatives are tricky, is knowing what rule is happening when. You can, of course, simplify this. If I do that, 2x cos. You don't need the extra parentheses around the cosine of 2x. But I warned about this in pre-calculus class. You don't want to have an ambiguous coefficient that looks like an exponent. So if you don't use parentheses, you have to be extra sure that your coefficient is big and appears all the way at the bottom like that. So it's not raised up at all. So we'll have a minus. I see a 2 times x squared. So we'll write 2x squared sine 2x. And just so you don't need those parentheses, sine 2x. So that's probably the most simple version. You could, of course, factor a 2x if you want, depending on what you're doing. But if you're answering a web work question, which is find the derivative, or a quiz question, which is find the derivative, I probably wouldn't spend time simplifying much. This would be plenty of simplification right here. You're going to be graded mostly on your calculus. But I will take POF points if I see bad algebra. So our next example. So I'm intentionally writing this without parenthesizing, and I'm using the bad trigonometric exponential notation. So before we go any further, let's add some extra parentheses around the input for the sine function. Now you want to make sure this is uh, not sine times this 3x squared, it's sine of 3x squared. What does this exponent actually mean? This cubed. Let's rewrite it with the exponent in the correct location, the one that makes more sense. So it means take sine first and then cube the result. So let's write it that way. So this is sine of 3x squared and then cube that. So take the sign first, and then cube that result. When you write it like this, it's a lot more clear what the outermost operation is. So we're making a sculpture, and we have to break off the outermost piece. What is the outermost operation here? Yep, the cube or the exponent, the power. That is not obvious on the first line. That cube looks like the innermost thing. It's hiding right in the middle, even though this is the three I'm talking about being in a misleading position. It looks like it's not the outermost operation. It's actually directly in the middle. But in fact, it is the outermost operation. So I strongly recommend you rewrite uh, your trigonometric exponents in this form when you do calculus. So what about those last parentheses in that equation? Oh, why? Wait, you mean the, like the outermost? So the reason is, I don't need it on this problem. But the way that operators work in general, if I write this, the derivative modifies the term to the right. So it's an operation that operates on the term on the right side. So if I don't use parentheses here, what I actually mean when I write this is take the derivative of f and multiply by g. 
So if I don't write a extra parentheses, I'm just taking the, the derivative operates on what's directly to the right of it. So you have an order of operations issue, basically. So to avoid that, I just I want to take derivative of the whole thing, so I just intentionally group it all together so you're seeing it's a derivative of this whole thing, not the derivative of just one part of it. Does that make sense? Uh, and I think it, when you use prime notation, it's super clear. Because if I write that, it looks like I'm just priming g of x. But I really mean to prime the entire product, f times g. So the way you write that whole thing with the prime outside. I was thinking, like, for example, in this, we put another parenthesis after the 3. So the way I'm thinking is to ask if you, if you push the screen over again to the, to the, to the other thing. If you, if you put another parenthesis over that prime, that's what it looks like to the cube. So I could, I mean, I could take the derivative and then cube that if I wanted to. Um, and there might be some situation that you want to cube the derivative. Uh, but for now, we're just taking the derivative of some function. And so what I'm doing is putting the, grouping the entire function together with parentheses. Instead of just, you know, if you just write like this, it's not very clear what you, what you mean. And the reason I said it's not necessary here, because there's actually only one term, the way it's written. But I just wrapped it in extra parentheses just to be safe. All right, so let's deal with the three. What rule do I use to deal with this exponent? So you got something cubed. So the exponent comes coefficient. So this is three times. So you just copy down the inside to the one less power. So all I did was deal with that cube power right there. So any questions on that part? I haven't done the actual chain rule, which is the going inside and dealing with the next uh, innermost function. So once you're done here, I recommend use a different color pen pencil, you can even use a highlighter, uh, I mean, you can kind of circle what you've just taken, uh, the part of the derivative you've just done. So exactly like I'm doing. You don't necessarily want to cross it out because when you come back later and look, it looks like it was not cubed at all. So you don't really want to cross it out, you're not canceling it, you're just acknowledging that I took care of that. So what is the derivative of the inside now? So forget that 3. What's the derivative of the inside? That, that'll be, so next, we do have to deal with the 3x squared, but the, out, the next outermost piece we deal with is a sine. So what's the derivative of sine? Cosine. So we go cosine and we just copy down the inside, the 3x squared part. So now we've taken care of the derivative of the sine, and we're going to go further in, and we have a 3x squared. So now this is that easy derivative. This is just that 6x. And you run it together like that? You just keep multiplying as you go over. So in this case, we applied the chain rule two times. Sometimes you may have to do it three or four times if it's functions of functions of functions of functions. Um, and there was not, we didn't even use a product rule here really at all. And you can combine this together. This is 18x. And you can use the bad notation for powers now. Once you're done doing calculus, you can use that trigonometric exponential notation that everybody uses.
So this next problem is the last example I'm going to do for the chain rolling class. So if this is still confusing. There's a few more problems that you go through in the book. That's a good place to start. You can also watch uh, other YouTube videos, Khan Academy, go to the Tutor Center. Um, although one of the best things to do is probably get one of your classmates to go over one of these problems with you because they're most likely in a similar situation that you are where all this stuff is new. So if you talk through it with somebody else, uh, that can be very useful because you'll actually have to decide how to break these down. So I used the minimum parentheses I could on this problem. Any less parentheses, and that would mean something different. So first of all, how do I deal with the square root? So that's a half power. So it would be silly to write tan 1 half x sine x. That would be a silly way to write it. Although we would know what you meant. But we're about to do calculus, so write the half power outside with an extra parenthesis. So don't write it like this. <coughs> you don't necessarily need these blue parentheses because it's already grouped up. That was my question. So it's already grouped up. I mean, if you want, you can put an extra two parentheses just because you feel like it okay. and it looks cool. But <laughs> you can add extra, I mean, you can just put parentheses around any term you really want to, uh, but you don't need to. All right, we're going to go outermost operation. So what is the outermost operation? Exponent, one half power. So it becomes coefficient, subtract one, don't mess up with fractions. So do that first step. questions on that first step right there. This is, we're definitely not done. All we did was address the half power. We still got look, quite a ways to go. All right, so now that we forget that half power is there, what is the next thing? And it's reasonable to use your hand to cover it up or an extra pen or something or a scrap of paper. What is the next outermost operation? Tangent, tangent of this stuff. So what is the derivative of tangent? That is secant squared. And secant squared of what? Of everything that we started with, x sine x. So we took care of the tangent. Now we're going to look at just what's left, x sine x. What rule do we use here? So there's a product happening inside here. So it's x times sine x. So if we group it up with extra parentheses, I'll go with some blue parentheses. This is really how you should think about it. x times sine x. So let's do that derivative separately. So go ahead and do the product rule separately out here.
So you should get sine x plus x cos x. And now we're just going to take that and write it down where it belongs down here. So this is derivative of that inside part, which is sine x plus x cos x. So not every derivative gets nicer than the original function. It's true for polynomials, but it's not true for functions in general, especially in time you have product or quotient going on. It's generally going to get worse. So that's probably the most complicated derivative I would consider giving you on a quiz or a midterm. Yes, sir? So after you find the derivative of the tangent, it keeps going to the right, and yeah, so you can, the problem gets bigger and bigger with that, correct? So like after you find this, so there's the, yeah. if I label things, that'll be step A, that's step B, and that is step C right there. Okay, yeah, but so is that one big answer or is that just three different kind of answers? Yeah, so the product of this, this whole thing multiplied together is okay. the derivative. Okay. You don't need to write the A, B, and C if that doesn't help you. If it does help you, good. I really recommend you get a second color pen or pencil so you can comment on your own math without thinking about what you're writing is the actual math, but it's comments on it. So the next two sections are, well, related rates is usually considered the most difficult section that we do in this quarter. Implicit differentiation is tricky, but not too bad. So we're going to be taking, at least for our examples here, we're going to take an x derivative on all these examples and think of the chain rule. <coughs> so what we're going to be doing now is taking derivative of an equation. So just like when you do algebra, if you're going to do something to one side of an equation, you do it to both sides of an equation. So if you're going to square one side, you better square both sides. Unless you're sure one of the sides is 0 or 1. But if you do something to one side, you have to do it to both sides. Or you're really not doing math. So I want you to do the difficult side, which is the right side. I'll, do, I'll write the left side, the derivative of the left side. So how do you take the x derivative of y? You just write it as dy dx. That's it. You're not really doing anything other than writing out this is the derivative of y with respect to x. And of course, you can write that as y prime if you want to. Explicitly apply So I'm going to explicitly apply the chain rule to x squared You don't need to do this, but I want you to just see what will happen So Chain rule we're going to look at the square power the second power. So we know this is 2 2 times uh, x, and I'm not going to write 2 to the first power. Uh, now times what? The derivative of the inside. 
And what is the inside? It's a little bit silly, but the inside is x. What is the x derivative of x? 1. So there's a few ways to write it. You could rewrite it as dx over dx, like that. And of course, anybody who knows anything about algebra would probably also tell you this was 1. But we know in calculus, it's 1 for calculus reasons. It's not coincidence that it algebraically simplifies to 1 as well, even if you know no calculus. Somebody would tell you this is 1. And we know calculus, it's also 1. <laughs> so this is just 2x times 1. So you can apply the chain rule. You can over-apply the chain rule. And you won't be wrong. You'll just get a times 1 at the end, as long as you apply it correctly. So this idea is how we're going to take derivatives of uh, so here we took an x derivative that matched x. So our chain rule gave us 1 at the end. If you take an x derivative, uh, x derivative of y, at the end you'll get a dy dx instead of a dx dx. So let's go ahead and do the x derivative. And we're going to take it of now y squared. And we're going to do exactly the same process, except there's going to be a y hanging out on the right side. So go ahead and apply the chain rule here. And I'll give you about 30 seconds to apply the chain rule, just like I did before, except you will have a y in one place where you had an x before. So there's a good chance you probably used too many brain cells and thought about this too much. You only need to rub together about two or three brain cells here. Derivative of y squared, 2y. But there's the chain rule. So what does the chain rule say? Once I take care of the square, now I have to go to the inside. What's left? Just y. So it's dy dx, which you could write, you could write it as d dx of y. If that works better for you, either way, it means the same thing. And you can write that as y prime if you're trying to save some ink or some pencil lead. So depending on how you want to write it, there's three ways to write it. They're all right there. So this idea is implicit differentiation here. When you take derivatives uh, with respect to a variable, and that variable is not, or you have additional variables that are not just x. So we'll go back to equations now. So I want to know what is dy dx when we start out with the equation y squared equals x. So this is going to be a parabola, but it's not a happy or sad parabola. It opens sideways. So I want you to do the calculus on this. And the way you do it is you take, so I want to find dy dx. And this is the same as the der x derivative of y. So the operator, the operation I need to do is the x derivative here. So I'm going to apply the x derivative to our, our equation. And I've already done these separately. So go ahead and apply the x derivative here. You've seen all these done separately. The right side is very easy to do. And I'm going to graph this function while you do this.
So we got that 2y dy dx, just like we did before. And the right side derivative is 1. So how do I solve for dy dx? What algebra do I do to solve for <laughs> dy dx? Yep, divide by 2y. That's all we have to do. And you could write it as y prime. So this should seem a little weird. This derivative's got no x's in it. That's quite strange. So there's a few reasons for that. Let's say you want to know the slope at 1. What is a problem with finding the slope at 1 when x equals 1? How many slopes are hanging out when x equals 1? There's two slopes. So x equaling 1 doesn't narrow it down to one of those two slopes. What you really need is a y value in this particular graph if you want to name a point on it. So on this graph, y values are unique. So if you said, hey, what about the y value of 1? Well, how many slopes are we talking about then? There's only one point with a y value of 1 on this graph. So let's go ahead and find the slope at 1 when y equals 1. So I'll just write slope at 1, 1. So we'll just be really specific. I want the slope right at that point up there, so the upper point. So we have some sort of new notation. It's not completely out of the blue, because you've seen this before. This is a vertical bar with a, a now we have a number or a point at the bottom. So what this means is evaluate at 1, 1. So it's a lot like the, uh, anti the definite integral when we plugged in the two values at the end. Oh, wait, we haven't done that yet at all. All right, so this is brand new notation. Talking to you like you already finished this class. All right. So this means evaluate So evaluate y prime at 1, 1. You also might see it written as y prime of 1, 1, but that's a little less common. So usually you're going to see it written. I'll try to write it with the vertical bar and the uh, point, the value you're going to plug in. So what is this? This is 1 over 2 times 1, which is 1 half right there. So our slope should be 1 half. And if we go up to the graph, I try to graph it accurately. So 1 half means if I go over 2, I better switch colors, go over 2 up 1. That looks pretty reasonable on this graph right here, slope of 1 half. You can find a tangent line pretty easily. You already got the point. You got the slope. You can find tangent line without a problem. There's going to be one point on this graph that has an undefined slope. So at the origin, you have vertical slope. So graphically, you can see that on the graph. If I right here draw a tangent line, it will actually be a vertical line right there. So we know vertical lines don't have a slope or don't have a number as their slope, it is undefined. And does that match up? What happens if you take y prime at 0, 0? You see undefined happening right there. And now you might be thinking, well, should this be positive infinity or negative infinity? Well, there's no limit here, so it's not, uh, it's actually going to be neither. And here's the reason. If you think about where these come from, they do come from limits. If we take points really close and look at their slopes, 
one of them will have a super po huge positive slope if you go one direction. And if you go the other direction, you'll have a super huge negative slope. And what happens as you move these two points closer to the origin, they become even bigger positive and negative values, except they're one's positive and one's negative. So the answer to is it positive or negative infinity? It's neither, or both, however you want to think about it. And let's go ahead and find the tangent line at two, uh, four negative two. So find the equation of a tangent line So you need a slope, and the good news is you got your point. So you don't have to do any, any work to find your point. You just need to figure out the slope. And you got y prime already. Your slope should be negative one fourth. Is that one over y, or one over two y? So it's one over negative four, or negative one fourth. And then the two ways to write your line, or the two popular ways to write your line, I wrote them both here. So any questions on getting the tangent line here? Now we get the tangent line at any point. The only one that's a little bit Weird. What is the equation of the tangent line, the vertical tangent line here? Well, zero is not an equation. What equals zero? So if y equals zero, that's a horizontal line where your y coordinate is always zero. So a vertical line, your x coordinate is always zero. No matter where you go, you got zero as your x coordinate. So that one is x equals zero. You can't write it as y equals anything because there's no y in it. So if you write y equals, you already are creating a form that's not going to work for this line. So vertical lines, the only lines that don't have slopes. So you'll get undefined, which means there's going to be no y in your line. So let's crank up the difficulty a little more. Actually, we'll write, we'll write out the algorithm for finding uh, the implicit derivative. Step one, differentiate both sides of the equation. Generally, it's going to be a ddx. Not always true, but almost always true. So you're going to take ddx of the entire equation. And step two, solve. For dy dx. So what type of an equation, or what type of a graph, uh, would this equation form? x squared plus y squared equals 1. Circle. 
circle. This is what all of pre-calculus 2 is based on, this particular circle. So I'll graph the circle. It's not terribly exciting. I'll have a radius of 1, so that'll be 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. So there are two points that I'll have vertical slope and undefined slope. So go ahead and take the, we're taking the x derivative of this. So I'll take the derivative of the right side, and you do the left side. So derivative 1 is 0. So you do the left side. We've done all these derivatives separately, so this is not, none of this should be new. I'm just putting it all together. So derivative of x squared, that's 2x. That's the easy part. Derivative of y squared is 2y times chain rule, which is times dy dx. If you're feeling lazy, you can just write y prime. It's up to you. So any questions on that derivative now? Well, it's not 2yy. Well, I mean 2y you can write it like that if, if that's better. This is the chain rule right here. It's what we did. Yep, they're all the same thing. So whatever one you feel like writing. Okay. You have to be able to see, like, see all three. For example, it's just like if somebody says hi or hello, you just you don't say, hey, that's not a, you know. It's the same word that means different thing. Or the different words that mean the same thing. There's different notation that means the same thing. No, that would be wrong because you need to have the derivative of y in there. Okay. Unless you took a y derivative. Uh, but if I took a y derivative, that would change the first term. So we took the x derivative. You're generally going to take the x derivative if it has x and y in the equation. Uh, if you take the y derivative, your slope will, the slope you get will be run over rise instead of rise over run. You'll switch the role of x and y, basically. So you can do that, but then you'll have to switch how you think about slopes. All right, how do I solve for dy dx? So when in algebraic doubt, go up. You don't have to go up. For example, I can multiply by a half first. It would be a very reasonable move. Knock out those twos. But if you're in doubt, do addition, subtraction first, multiplication, division second, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll go ahead and So I'll do two of those at one time, and then divide by y. So there's y prime. So there'll be some places where the derivative is undefined, or the slope is undefined. What y values make our slope undefined? Zero. So what points are those in the circle? The two points where y is zero. And we look, oh, that makes sense. Vertical slope, vertical slope. So it better be undefined, or we got some problems. What makes the slope zero, or a horizontal slope? Y's got nothing to do with it. So when x is zero, you got horizontal slope. And of course, that's the top and bottom points on the circle. And other points, you can plug those in, and you'll get whatever that slope happens to be right there. So you can pick whatever point you want and plug it in. And you know you can find your tangent line equation by using your point and your slope. So we'll do one more, more complicated problem. So the calculus part of these was relatively easy. I didn't do any product rule, chain rule, any of that fun stuff. So we'll do one more example where we bring in those rules and do implicit differentiation at the same time. And then our algebra will be way harder than just subtract, uh, divide. 
Other question? 